Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. I am honored today to have Joanne Wingfield. She is the author of the brand new book, Well Spouse, and it comes out today. So thanks for joining me, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you have joined the ranks of authors writing about Alzheimer's. Can you first tell me about your husband, Clyde, since he's obviously the inspiration for the book? Uh, well, what, where should I start? Uh, we met uh, shortly after I came to this country. I'm originally from China. And, uh, uh, you know, he was a professor in the university uh, I was a graduate student. We don't have a teacher-student relationship, but that is a no-no. <laughs> but we met through a common friend. And for many years, uh, he was uh, like my coach. He taught me so much, you know, as a new graduate student, a foreigner in this country. Everything is new and so much learning to do. So eventually the relationship evolved, just like many relationships. Uh, he, uh, he, was, he was a Korean War veteran and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, have been quite established in higher education. So, you know, I felt like I can learn so much from him. And uh, once the relationship become personal, he also took very good care of me. So I, I oftentimes think of that like investment. You know, it become the capital in the relationship. In hard times, I can dig into it to find the strength. So he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2002? He was diagnosed in 2002, although there were some uh, signs long before that, uh, but we didn't know for sure. And uh, yes, eventually he was diagnosed uh, in 2002. What kind of early signs did he have? Because I talk about my moms a lot, but I should ask that question of guests more often. Yeah, the early signs is, okay, so he is a very organized person, very neat. And then um, suddenly I found on, on, on occasions, the drawers, you know, the bedroom drawers are open mm -hmm. and uh, the lights are on even during the day. And uh, once in a while, the water, the bathroom water is running. And those were, you know, they didn't happen every day, but it's a, such a departure from his normal behavior. So it's kind of alarming. And then I, I remember I joked with him, but other, other than that, his function was still good. And carries good conversation and no problem driving. So I, I, teased him. I said, you must have Alzheimer's. <laughs> but it was a joke. But it was a joke. And then I, I got to the point, you know, so many people around me, friends, parents, and the relatives have Alzheimer's. I said, why don't you talk to your doctor? So we can, if we can exclude it, at least we can exclude it. So he went to talk to his doctor to his doctor. His doctor gave him a, what's called a mini mental scale. And uh, his doctor told him, you have some age-related memory loss, but it's still within the scope as normal. But now we know it's, it's actually early signs. I wonder if they still think that way now that we're talking you know 18 19 years later because i've talked to people whose spouses are you know highly educated very very intelligent and they're able to hide the 
Yes. They have more coping techniques for yes. their memory not working the way it used to. And so it, it takes longer to get diagnosed. They basically have to run out of, of coping tools. Yes. I'm wondering if they do it. I don't know. The medical profession is hard to do with it. So now I don't know, but uh, uh, now I think once you reach 65 or something, your family doctor automatically give you men, uh, mental test, cognitive test automatically. I believe that is correct. The Alzheimer's Association has been working on that. I'm a legislative um, advocate volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I'm, that sounds like it's either a law that's, I think that has been passed. It was the HOPE Act or the Improve HOPE Act. There was a second one after the HOPE Act and I get all confused with all these acronyms. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's important to, to test it early. Yes. That yeah. way you can make lifestyle adjustments if you need to. You can yes. plan all these good yes. things. Yeah. So... How, so when did he pass away? He passed away in 2011. So it is a nine year battle. Seems like somewhere around a decade is about normal. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know now because the research keep changing, you know, update our knowledge. But at the time of his diagnosis, I was told people could die from two years to 20 years. But eight year from a diagnosis to death, eight year is the average. That doesn't mean the progression of the disease because we can only start from the diagnosis. And as you said, more intelligent people usually diagnosed later. And my mom was diagnosed later. And let's see, she was diagnosed in September of 2011 and passed away in March, 2020. So that's like eight and a half years. Oh, so, but we yeah, Reagan, Reagan had a 10 years from diagnosis. Also. Yeah. yeah, so that I just know her diagnosis came so late. She was already in the middle stages when they okay. finally got a diagnosis for her. And some of it was her resistance. I think she knew what was going on and she didn't, she didn't yes. want to know officially, which is pretty yeah. common. Yeah. I, I, I deal with that question because, you know, they're coming up with the blood test that's supposed to, um, yes. I don't know if it tests that you have it or you're at risk for having it. Now I've forgotten, but it's like, I have a family history. I don't know if you want to know or not. <laughs> I should. And I probably would talk myself into it, but it, when you, yes. knowing <laughs> how <laughs> ugly this disease is, it's like, yeah. I don't, I don't really want to know. So no. Go ahead. The doctors don't recommend that uh, uh, the, di the diagnose, the blood test, the DNA test will decide that you are at high risk. They cannot be 100%. Okay? Right. So, but the doctor don't recommend it because if you know what you're going to do, other than make you miserable, make the people around you miserable, there's no cure. So what do you, what you're going to do? Well, hopefully you start checking off a lot of your bucket list and you make, you make decisions while you still have the time to make the decisions, like end of life choices. Yeah. Everybody always says they want to live in their own home until the end. And that's not always safe or practical. Yes. And those are the conversations like we never had. My dad passed away and his friend said, well, um, your dad thinks your mom will just come live with you. And it was like, oh, I don't think so. My daughter just moved out last month. <laughs> <laughs> I was 50 when he died. So I wasn't ready to be tied down with my mom, especially because I figured it'd be at least 10 years. If I'd known it was in three, I might have, I don't know, I might have done something different. But <laughs> hindsight is always 2020. It's, you know, and, and she, one of the reasons I chose a memory care residence was so that she would have the stimulation of other residents. Yes. And that worked out really great. She had, she had quite a few friends. I would take her and another lady out occasionally to the park to watch the kids. Everybody always thought I was insane for doing that, but they kept each other company. They talked to each other and they yeah. didn't get irritated when they kept repeating themselves. Yeah. So 
it made it a little bit easier for me by taking two of them, even though that sounds crazy. So tell me about the, besides your husband, tell me about the inspiration for your book. Okay. So during my uh, time as a well spouse, taking care of my husband, there are such hard, hard moments. Okay. There were moments I felt like, how am I going to get through this? I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to write a book so other people will know. You know, it's sort of like a, a consolation to myself, right? And then there are so many also hilarious moments. I said, other people is not going to see this. They have to know this. You know, regardless how hard life is, there are those sparks of, of moments, okay? Light-hearted moments. Other people don't know. They needed to know it. So I always wanted to write a book. And uh, so, you know, eventually I retired. And uh, I think it's uh, part of it is my own therapy to reveal this, this journey. Part of it is uh, I remember so many times I'm thinking, what is coming? What was coming? I wish I knew what was coming. I don't know what was coming. Okay, the unknown was give me so much anxiety. And I'm thinking, okay, now I know, now I know. And I said, maybe other people have the same feeling I had. They wanted to know. You know, even if it's just one person's story, you know, it still can be uh, enlightening and it can be inspired. I agree. Uh, there was times I, I, after my mom passed away, I sent a video, I waited a little bit of time, but I sent a video that had, I had taken of mom about a month before she passed away. No, about a, a little more than a month. And she was telling me how her brothers were normal people now. And I thought that was quite interesting because as far as I know, my uncles have always been normal people. <laughs> and it was just really cute. And she, you know, she was talking about how they were normal people and and then she started talking about somebody else. I had no idea what she was talking about. And so those, when you could find that, when you could see that, and, you know, she's talking about, oh, my brothers are normal people. And instead of, I learned the hard way, instead of trying to figure out what she meant by that, I would just laugh and go, oh, they're normal people. Oh, that's so yeah. good to hear. Yeah. I'm so glad they're normal now. <laughs> yeah. And I would get a laugh and that would just, it would, it always helped the situation tremendously if I could stay yes. very relaxed. Yes. Yeah. So how there's um, some questions that you attempt to answer in the book. And one of them is how does love endure through the mundane task and drudgery of caregiving that can last years or even a decade or more. And that, yeah. That applies even to adult children of people living with Alzheimer's or dementia, because there were times my mom was not terribly lovable. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know what you said is right. Okay, there are moments, it's like our children, there are moments they are not lovable, but regardless, you still love them, right? So these are, so that's, that's there that has some similarity, but it's also very different you know taking care of children you have the hope one day they will grow up and they will be independent and maybe they will even take care of you but with uh, an Alzheimer's spouse it's one-way channel okay there's only things going in there's very little thing comes out and for me the hardest part is uh, you know he was such an intelligent People. We both work for university. So, uh, you know, the, the intellectual communication is important to us. And, uh, you, you know, I, I know I'm going to, I was going to lose that. And eventually, he didn't even know you. We always said love is a two-way channel, right? You have to nurture the relationship. Otherwise, the relationship die. So in this situation, you know, you nurture your husband, but there's nothing to nurture back. So does the love, how does the love endure? So that was a big question I had. And uh, 
I found as I going through that, as you said, there are moments I was ugly. In my book, I have a chapter talk about this ugliness called the better angel. Okay, so that's Lincoln's uh, quoting Lincoln. Okay, sometimes we let the things get the better angel of us and we lost our good temper and our good heartedness. But I have to put things in perspective that is temporary and that is okay. In the long run, in, in order to restore your sanity, you need an outlet. And as long as you have that perspective that we all have our limit, and at one point that limit is, I just scream at him. Okay, I burst into howling, crying, because it was so hard. And, uh, but afterwards, you know, I restore my sanity. I know that storm is over, it's over, and I will not abandon him. You know, it's a vow I want to keep, and I have the strength to keep. So you have to lift yourself a little high, look a little further to see this is a face, and this will end. And how does love endure? For me, we were chatting about relationship, okay? I felt like uh, we had a, such a good relationship. You know, when I was a graduate student and I was so clueless about this country, <laughs> and he taught me so much, okay? I, I got my first job and then I was promoted to become a university administrator and he had so much experience, okay? He was my coach on the side literally. And I felt like I owe my success, my career success, so much to him. Plus, in personal, in life, he, you know, at first I was a single mother. He took care of me. You know, it's not that he took care of me financially. I had always had my job, okay, but he let me know if I have trouble. If I'm in dire need, he will take care of me. But knowing that give me strength, give me a sense of security. Okay. At one time, my uh, son's teenager years, he was very rebellion. Okay. Every time we had a big, big problem and my hearts are just like my guts are torn apart. Okay. Because you, you heard him with this kid. Um, he always said it to me, honey, regardless what happened, we will get through this together. So he invested so much in the relationship. I felt, you know, in the hard time of thinking, okay, thinking the good time together. Again, give me a perspective, okay, that, uh, that uh, you know, this, I, I, for me, I oftentimes told people, okay, I asked myself many times during my well spouse years, if knowing this was the end, I would end up like this, okay? No feedback from my husband, only very okay, diet, uh, Monday routines. Uh, would I, you know, marry him? And my answer has never wavered. It's always yes. For the good years, for the 13 good years we were together, I would, I would say yes. I'd rather take this because, you know, I knew what is love. And also I knew he made me a very strong woman. Okay, I, I, so much of my growth is with him and he nurtured me. Um, I felt like... Uh, I owe so much success to him. It's not just, oh, I genuinely love him. He made me feel I'm a worthy person. Yeah. So uh, that's another part, how love endure. Okay. Then there is another big transformation moment. That is when, you know, in the care facility, he had a girlfriend. <laughs> oh, it was... Uh, it was cute, but it was also very hurting. Okay, 
because a, a, a love relationship is very exclusive. You don't let other opposite side sex coming in, right? It's mm -hmm. a two person world that you don't let other people in. But now I have, I, you know, I, I didn't have to, but I thought about it, you know, how does this relationship change? Then I rationalized things. Okay, one, their relationship is very innocent. They don't even know each other's name. <laughs> it's a very innocent relationship, okay? So I don't consider this as a betrayal of our love, okay? And the two, if I really love him, I'm at work, I was at work. If he had some companionship, give him a sense of security okay if I claim to love him I shouldn't deprive him of that relationship okay so uh, uh, and then that woman is like a baby doesn't know anybody and uh, I also have compassion for her she was sick and she was like innocent baby so this is a transformation for me I felt my love grow, grow into a more mature love and a bigger love. It's a love for humanity. It's not an exclusive love. I can still love my husband and I can love this little girlfriend, girlfriend <laughs> he had. And in that way, my love transformed. I can see you that. know that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that that I don't want him all but for myself. You know, you have to go through a period of time of adjustment, and doesn't mean I don't miss the old time he was all mine. Okay, but rationally, I understand. Then I accept. So. And then the other thing is thinking, okay, it's a phase. I don't know how long this is going to take, but it will end. There is going to be next phase, phase. yeah. So it's not easy. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting because my mom mostly shunned all there weren't a lot of male residents where she lived but she she kind of swatted them away and it was funny this year 2020 when i sh showed up to visit with her and it happened to be her wedding anniversary and she's talking to some new gentleman resident and i thought well this is interesting <laughs> <laughs> they were just chatting that's what my mom yeah. did my mom would yeah. just chat yeah. and it was wonderful, like I said, you know, when I could involve another resident and we could all just sit and chat, it they could talk to each other and not not drive each other nuts. And it and it gave me a little it gave me a chance to step back mentally and just kind of observe the relationships that she was having. So it's kind of similar, although I never had to deal with the whole boyfriend girlfriend thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think you're the first person I've talked to, surprisingly, that has mentioned that their spouse had a little bit of a twinkle in their eye for somebody else. Oh yeah, they 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 were together every day. They were holding hands, oh. and then in my book, I I talked about uh, they are honey this, honey that. They don't know that each other's name, but like a two puppy love. Okay, it was just it's cute to see. But one day I went there and. And she put a big kiss on his face. And there is an embossed okay. uh, lip. And it just pierced my heart. Okay. You know, you still love this man as a husband. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, um, yeah, it was some experience. I'm sure. I did read a story in the recent past about a wife was visiting her husband in the care residence daily and he forgot who she was but she was there every day and he fell in love with her again and asked her to marry him again. oh okay. so they did a you know basically a wedding ceremony for these oh, two wow. 
And I thought, wow, that's really pretty sweet that he basically yeah. picked her twice. Yes, yes, yes. No, so, yeah. you know, I uh, think she was there. I know she was there daily, and I don't remember if she would, like, I've talked to some guests that go and have, you know, meals. They'll go and have breakfast and then go do yes. errands or chores or whatever, and then go back and have lunch, or they'll have at least two meals a day with their spouse, and and that, I always enjoyed having meals with my mom. It got a little trickier at the end when she was having difficulty, like the day she tried to eat, um, what was it? She's trying to eat a hamburger with a fork, a sandwich with a fork. And I'm like, it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have a problem with, you know, her using her hands because that's fine. But it was funny. I'm like, you have finger food and you're trying to use a fork. And then the yeah. meal that required utensils, she was trying to use her hands. And I was like, yeah. oh boy, this is crazy. Yeah. And, you know, it got, at the very end, it got to the point where it was difficult to take her to a regular restaurant because yes. it, it, people don't understand. And she was very yeah. conversational still right yeah. up until the oh. end. She walked and talked and, yeah. you know, it was difficult to know that she had Alzheimer's. Yeah. You could tell something wasn't quite right with her. Yes. She, yeah. You know, they, they don't, they don't look quite their old selves, but yeah, it, it, and she would fuss about the mess, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a messy eater, and she would, <laughs> food would hit the table, and she'd spend three minutes cleaning up the table, and it's like, just please eat, <laughs> you know, like, we're here to eat, and I learned at the very beginning of this year, I would go, because when we were in the process of moving, this worked quite well, I would go and pick her up after her lunch and take her out. And I would have lunch and then I would just get her something to nibble on. And if she ate it, great. Uh -huh. if she didn't, it, I didn't have to worry about her getting enough nutrition. And that took a lot of the pressure off of me, you know, fussing about, you know, please get some of this nutritional, nutrition, nutritionist, oh my gracious. <laughs> Healthy food. There we will just switch words since that one's not wanting to pop out properly. Please eat this healthy food and, you know, sustain your system. And, you know, and, and that angst, she picked up on that stuff. I, I could be like, oh, wait, nope, relax, relax. And, and she'd pick up on it so quick and her immediate reaction would be to get angry. And so that oh. was not good. And I had an incident you were talking about when your, your lesser angel takes over and we don't have such a great day. She, at the very end, was getting to the point where she was clawing people. If she was angry at you, she would grab your arm and just dig her fingernails in, and it was not pleasant. She drew blood on some of the caregivers. So I- Oh took, my gosh. Oh, it was okay. embarrassing. She drew blood on my husband too. It was, I, I avoided that, but this one day, I don't know, I don't know what was wrong with me, <laughs> but I just, I hit every one of her trigger buttons and I was, I got to the point where I'd carry nail clippers in my purse so that if her nails were getting long, I could just yes. easily trim them and, and, you know, give her a little hand massage and try to make it nice. And this one day, I don't, man, she and I were just at odds with each other. It was just, it was one of those visits. I should have, I should have caught on sooner and cut it short because we were just irritating each other. It was just escalating. And she got angry with me and she grabbed my arm and, and I just grabbed her hands and pulled them away from my arm. Like, uh, uh, you are not going to do that to me. And I said, I, you know, then I, I waited a minute and I said, oh my goodness, you've got a couple of really, you know, badly chipped nails. Let me, can I, can I fix those for you? Yes. Next thing I know, she's clawing the daylights out of me. And I'm like, and at that point I was like, I'd had it. And we were sitting in the bench outside the door to the memory care and I literally just grabbed her elbow and propelled her in and opened the doors. And I said, enjoy your life and slammed the doors and I left. And even one of the caregivers, um, one of the med techs, she's like, man, I remember that day. That was not a good day for you too. And I'm like, no, that was yeah. not a good day. I'm like I got to the point where I knew if I even attempted to stay, it was going to get worse. And I said, we were already at bad. We didn't need to yeah. get worse. So I felt yeah. badly because that was maybe a month and a half before she died. So I was like, oh great, that's not one of the last memories I wanted to have, but 
you know, it is what it is. So I, woman, woman use their claws, you know, men yeah. is different. The, Clyde got very, uh, 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 you know, mad at uh, the staff in, in the care facility. Yeah, so she, he grabbed the staff by the chest and, sh mm. and shook her up against Ooh. the wall. Yeah, Ooh. so eventually they kicked him out. Oh no. Yeah, we we've been everywhere. That's why I said I wanted to write the book because we've been everywhere. We've been to the care facility, we stayed home, then we get into a, another apartment all over. It's a crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy journey. Uh, crazy. Yeah, my mom would swear at people. Like the day that she clawed my husband, we were trying to figure out why <clears throat> she was having such pain and walking. And I really wish her doctors had paid attention because as I mentioned before we started recording, she fell on December 30th and I, she had a regularly scheduled neurology appointment March or March, January 6th. And so, you know, we're talking a week. So I picked her up early and took her to the urgent care and they tried to do x-rays and she was like, not having it. And so this, at the end of January, right in the middle of moving, you know, there was some other issues. I was really trying to get the stitches taken out that she'd gotten put in on December 30th. But the doctor was like, let's do an x-ray again, try to get the x-ray again. And so I, I, she was all for it. She was going to, you know, she understood why we needed to do the x-ray. She was all for it until we get into the exam room and she's just like, nope, not doing it. And I had rearranged my morning to make this happen for her. So first I tried, you know, sweet talking and kind yeah. of tease her into getting it done. And then I tried to guilt her into it by saying, look, I had to rearrange my appointments. So could we please get this done? And oh my goodness, she mentally just dug in. And so I said, can you stand up for me? And she said, she did. And I literally put my foot next to hers and just pivoted her and plopped her on the table. Yeah, yeah. Well, she wasn't real happy about that. And she literally, the, the, the x-ray technician was fantastic because man, she got my mom in the right position to just hit the button, three x-rays <laughs> in like less than a minute. You know, normally they worry about getting you all protected. Nope. That, I'm not even sure the x-ray technician was wearing the, the lead apron okay. or any of that. She knew we did not have time to fool around with protocol. And yeah. I appreciated that. So she's laying on, you know, the x-ray table, which is like metal. It's like really yeah. not pleasant. Uh -huh. She's like, I'm going back to my room now. I'm like, okay, that's great. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and she just laid there like with her hands across her chest like a corpse and I was like this is not going well yeah. and so I'm like she's mad at me because I basically forced her into this so I basically stepped into the doorway so that she couldn't see me and the x-ray technician was a gal and she sweet talked my mom and my mom basically referred to her in terms we don't like to say to people and you know it's not polite and the gal's like, oh, and I'm like, let's just give her a minute. Let's see if she'll calm down if we stop bugging her. And so we waited two or three minutes and she went and got another nurse who had not seen my mom at all. And she came in super sweet. She must've worked with kids or something. And she came in and it's like, what's going on? And my mom's like, everybody around here is assholes. And I'm like, oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and there was some other words in there too. And so the gal tried to sweet talk her. And at this point I'd already called my husband. It was like, he's like literally like five minutes away. And he comes over and he's like, what's going on mom? And she's swearing at people. And he goes, well, I, I need your help. Her dog that she had, she lived with her dog in the memory care for the first 18 months. And then they renovated and the dog really needed a lot more care than she was able to get in the memory residence. So we had to rehome her. The dog also weighed twice what she should have weighed. So that wasn't good for anybody. Oh, yeah. And so he's like, I really need help with Misty. <laughs> that usually worked. My mom had dogs all her life. And he's like, I forgot exactly what the excuse was, but he's like, can you come help me with Misty? And my mom's like, no, she'll be fine. And my husband's like, well, okay. And so he reached out and goes, come on, let me, he's like, I know everybody here is blah, blah, blahs. 
let's just get out of here. And she scratched him and drew blood. Holy Toledo. Oh. Then, I had, then she was mad and he was mad. <laughs> it was not a good morning. And he, I think, I think he literally picked her up and put her in the wheelchair because what she was using because it was very painful to walk and all the way out to the car you know these people are meh, 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 and, meh, 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 and, blah, blah. and i'm like oh this is gonna be a fun drive back to the you know her <laughs> residence and he he was so angry he was we were he was tired from moving and angry and he slams the door and then he's standing there next to the car and i roll down the window i'm like what and he goes are you gonna be okay and i'm like just leave it'll be fine i don't think she's mad at me anymore i think she's mad yeah. at you so like <laughs> yeah. that's like the one advantage it's like just give it some time she's gonna forget which who she's mad at yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. i rolled the window back up and she's like these people are all and i'm like yeah they are let's get the heck out of here <laughs> i'm like what kind of reality is this this is insane yeah. so yeah that was the very end of in the January, like I think it was like the January twenty seventh. It was a Thursday, and it was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is like the worst. The twenty seventh yeah. wasn't a Thursday, but yeah, it was. Whatever the last Thursday of January was, it was just nuts. But yeah, it was like that was that was the last couple of months was just constantly doing everything you could not to upset her because she'd literally start swearing at people and calling people obnoxious names and scratching people. <laughs> Fortunately, yeah. they never threw her out, though. <laughs> yeah. So one thing, one thing useful to remember is if they get mad, okay, you know, after a while they don't remember it. Right. <laughs> Nothing happened. Yeah. You still upset, but they already forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had an incident where, bef um, she'd been in the care facility about six months with her dog, and the med techs, the executive director, and I had put like a program in place so that the dog would get fed properly so that maybe she could lose some weight because it, the excessive weight also caused other problems that were gross. That's probably enough of a description. <laughs> and so I was literally trying to shove the dog into my mom's room at dinner time, and I was gonna go and this other resident had gotten it in her head that it was her dog. So yeah, she was not happy that I was stealing her dog. Yeah. And she reached out and grabbed my mom's forearm in an attempt to get my mom to help me stop stealing this other gal's dog, but it was my mom's dog. Okay. So I've got these two old ladies fighting. My mom's like, if you touch me one more time, I'm going to knock your block off. And I was like, uh oh, you know, <laughs> warning, warning. And her room was directly across the hall from the doorway to the courtyard. So I literally shoved her into the courtyard and she was so angry at this woman because this woman thought my mom's dog was hers. My mom yeah. was shaking and I knew I'm like, this is the one time that no memory is going to really play up well. And I just kept saying, oh, it's so sad that, you know, so-and-so thinks that Misty is hers and oh, her mind is so bad. I just kept repeating this like pity, pity, pity. And yeah. all of a sudden my mom looks through the window and goes, Oh, I think we're having dinner. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yes. And then I get home and my dad had signed them both up for the NRA. We won't even go there. Um, you know, I'm in California. It's a blue state. I'm not a fan of the NRA. And so I'm getting all of the NRA mail at my house. And it's like, I think the mailman's about to like leave, leave a bag of dog stuff on my porch, but I have my own dog. So maybe not. And I get home and there's this big postcard black background red angry looking letters and it says free gun and it's addressed to my mom i'm like yeah that's what she needs <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that was the start of my my alzheimer's caregiver journey for other caregivers because i put that story out on facebook and a past photography client of mine who's a business coach said you should write a book and I said, I'm thinking about it, but it's probably something I should do after mom's gone because it doesn't seem like the right time to do it now. And so this was, that was September of 2017. I seriously didn't think that she would be gone by March of 2020. And I went looking for a podcast 
that talked about what, you know, talked about the stuff we're talking about. And there was essentially one and it, it wasn't my flavor. It just didn't speak to me. So I'm like a big podcast listener. Uh-huh. And one of them I listened to basically talked about how to start a podcast. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So, so you started. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And it's yeah. been wonderful. So um, the, one of the other questions that you address in your book is like, what does triumph mean when you're fighting a war with a disease that has no cure? So what kind of, like I just described a couple of wins for me. What, yes. What were, what were your triumphs? What what was my triumph? You know, uh, I, I was a university professor, so maybe sometimes my talk is too uh, uh, bookish, so I have to apologize for that. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, so this one, uh, you know, is going to die. And in between, it's just this, so much heartbreaking stories and the, so hard. And so there's no, what's the reason, what, what the reason to make you be, to be uh, optimistic, what you optimistic about. You're losing your husband, he's dying little by little, every day you're exhausted. And uh, so, you know, what you feel, we, we live for hope, right? Mm-hmm. The human beings live for hope. So, you know, I often am thinking about these things. So one is, you're looking for small things. We talk about all those little funny moments and things like that, you know, uh, little moments. And I do have lots of these moments. And also, uh, I felt like uh, at the end, I did, I, I, the disease, the caregiving, did not turn me into a bitter person. Okay, don't let the disease defeat you. Don't feel defeated, like all my spirits are gone. You know, what's the life is about? You know, what's the marriage is about? You know, it's all just uh, all those uh, 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 hard things, you know, painful things. But in between, I met people who helped me and I helped them. We helped each other. And uh, we, you know, it assured me the humanity, okay, the, the, the world. There are lots of love, sympathy, understanding. People still need you. And even in these moments, I, I'm, I was still able to give people something in return. And also, I received so much from other people. So at the end, I felt the triumph for me means the humanity wings. It made me see that life can be full of uh, uh, hardship and the painful things. And the, yes, there is a sickness and the death and the, there are betrayal, okay. But the, still, I choose to see the world still have full of compassion and people are willing to help you, and you can still do something good for other people, not just for my husband, okay, also other people. So that give me a sense of worthiness and make me feel happy. So that's my triumph. At the end, I feel like I'm stronger. I went through another very hard journey and uh, i'm still a person happy person i'm still optimistic and i still believe that people are good uh uh uh, you know like people say glass half full half empty yeah there are lots of bad things uh, uh you know in the world but you want to be better person you want to be part of the the, the good, the kindness, the compassion, then the world is a better place. I agree with that. It's been a bit of a challenge losing mom, the very start of the pandemic and not being able to do a celebration of life. And it's just been, 2020 has not been a great year. <laughs> you know, it has not been, yes. <laughs> 
There, I, I'm frequently on Twitter with a big uh, podcast group oh, wow. and yeah. a lot of people will comment about the, something in the news and they're like, I did not have such and such on my 2020 hellscape bingo card. <laughs> Cause it seems like every week is some kind of, it's like, really? And we get this yeah. Sahara de- dust storm blowing across part of the country and we have the pandemic and yeah. I'm in California. So we're already in our fire, you know, wildfire. The riots. The yeah, riots. Riot. I'm like, it's like holy yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually told my husband, I said, somebody should actually make hellscape bingo as a game because i think people would actually find it pretty funny and yeah. it's interesting people can say you know they can joke about something that's you know right now is bad but you know and god only knows <laughs> what'll be bad next week or next month and so that's i try to on days when i'm just having a really rough time i try to either go out and take pictures of flowers or yesterday was a rough day and I don't know what was going on with my emotions. Just everything was irritating me. It was like, you know, <laughs> my husband breathing was, it's like, and I was like, yeah. and the, I have three golden retrievers and the girl dog sleeps on the couch and she's literally draped over a pillow. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm very glad that I can provide such a comfortable life for you. She's on the couch right now. Yeah. But I looked at her and I'm like, I need to learn this, this amount of Zen because, and I just watched her for a while because it was so calming because she was just yes. so relaxed and so cute. Yes. So yes. sometimes you, you know, that's a very important part. I'm sorry I cut you off. Okay, so in my book, I talked about dogs and it is, I have to, because they are just, they are just so much part of a therapy. That is true. And here's Mimi. Oh, hi, yeah. Mimi. Yeah. So much part of therapy, uh, especially, you know, I, my, most of my family are in China. So I have less of a support family here, uh, especially when I was in Texas. Uh, well, you know, my husband and I left. So uh, you have to find these things. You have to find your um, safety net. You, you know, you know, in the normal marriage, husband and wife, we are each other's safety net, right? So what, lose a spouse, you lose a big part of your safety net. And you have to mend that safety net yourself. And so I think I did that. I relied very much on caregivers and friends. And then the other thing is to find those little moments, okay? Even today, you look at the world, we know there are so many things going on. It makes you feel like a really losing sense of control. But come back to the small world. You know, I have my dog. I have my beautiful home. And uh, I can still take a walk. Like in China, when they had the pandemic, you cannot get out of your house, literally. Okay, no. the communist countries, they secure it. They have someone at your door. Don't let you go out. You know, we still have the freedom here, you know, in, in large part. Uh, uh, My whole attitude so, with, the, with the stay at home, you know, for some of us, it's been orders. Other pl- places, it's been recommendations. It's yeah. not political. It's not my right versus your right it's what we need to do to take care of each other we need to take care of each other and we need to uh practice our common sense use our common sense yeah some things are not political it's just the common sense everybody can understand common sense yeah unfortunately i think we've politicized common sense sometimes (laughs) yes i know yeah unfortunately yeah so it's definitely it's a challenge. So let me ask the one last question and then we maybe could wrap up a little bit so we're not here for two hours because I can, I can do this all day. <laughs> so how can we find our way on this difficult journey of caregiving for a loved one with Alzheimer's? And I, I think this question is more pertinent for spouse caregivers than maybe adult child caregivers 
especially the sandwich generation ones because i know i was torn between yeah. my life and taking care of mom and i found my way by starting a podcast <laughs> okay yes and that's wonderful that's wonderful you see okay that's like a, you you're doing the podcast is like i'm writing the book okay you have to have an outlet okay and this outlet not only is a way for us to let out our uh, hurt our frustration and uh, whatever sometimes anger uh, okay but it is also a way for us to feel we are useful maybe to other people and that's very important to human being like okay my well spouse yes my husband, I, I don't get the feedback from my husband that he needs me. Okay, I know he needed me, definitely. But he's not able to voice that. Okay, and we all have to have a sense of a self-worthiness. We are doing a good thing. We are doing a good cause. And, uh, you know, it's bigger than just one person. So back to how do you find your way I don't know if there is a simple answer. You know, at the beginning, when my husband first diagnosed, I know I love him, I will take care of him. And, but I don't know where my limit is. Can I, could I go through this? You don't know until you go through it. That's true. Yeah, you can make all kinds of promise. People get married, you know, on their wedding vow, <laughs> they, 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 they vow to stay together, but you know, once you get on this journey, you find that, oops, I couldn't do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I oftentimes wonder, you know, will I get through this and still a whole piece intact, you know, not bitter, uh, angry, and all these kind of things. And I have seen well spouse angry, really angry. Okay. So I'm thinking, when is the determination? When is every step? try to see uh, what, uh, you know, what you can do, where you can find some happiness, some worthiness in your life, where you can get help. You need to, since the feedback from your husband is not any, there anymore, you need to find other source of feedback, give you the confidence that you are doing the right thing, you are strong, um, I, I think that's very important for me. And then the other thing is constantly telling myself, it's a face. It will go and it will be over. I don't know when, but it will. I'm not a religious. Some people are religious. They have that sense of confidence. Of, you know, God planned this and God will take care of me. Okay. I, I did not have that sense, but I know it's a face. It will be over. And then uh, I think the other thing is acceptance, okay? Accept the situation. This is a hard situation, okay? And I will make the best out of this bad situation. And then I will accept myself. You know, I have limits when I get really frustrated. You know, I had those outbursts, ugly outbursts, and it's okay. I accept myself. It's okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Everybody have a different way. You know, some people take, uh, 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 keep uh, the patient at home. Some people cannot take patient at home. Just find whatever way. Um, and I think society now is more aware of mm -hmm. this disease. I think for many caregivers the most needed thing is someone to listen to them to understand them and also respite okay i know i'm fortunate uh, you know i had hired a caregiver for majority of time uh but in the middle the caregiver had cancer so i had to deal with that so that's why i want to tell my story there are so many things happen uh, during the journey and it's not planned unexpected you just have to be you know flexible see what's the best in the worst situation 
which is uh, a great question to be asking of this particular year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my goal with my mom was to always do things that brought her a little joy or, um, you know, better quality of life. That's why I made the effort to take her to the park and watch the kids yes. in the pool and the kids in the yes. splash zone. And, the kid. and yeah. there were times because she didn't walk, she walked fine, but she didn't know that she walked fine. So sometimes getting her from the car to yes. where the kids were, sometimes that was so frustrating. I wanted, she was, she weighed significantly less than I did. And there were times I wanted to just throw her over my shoulder, <laughs> <laughs> which she would not have appreciated yeah. at all. Yeah. And what I did when she was watching the kids, cause you know, eh, not my thing is I would just put my head back on the bench and watch the trees and the sky. Yes. Breathe deeply yeah. and just, yeah. you know, try to just relax and just enjoy like the little slower, slower time, which I'm personally a little tired of slower time right now. Yeah. <laughs> Having spent the whole year pretty much not going anywhere. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is this for this uh the, the one of the caregivers I had uh gave me a very good uh, perspective. Okay. So he talked to me, he said that there are good days, there are bad days. Okay. If it's a bad day, just think tomorrow may be a good day. And that helps me, okay. If it's a good day, savor it. If it's a bad day, just look at it. Tomorrow, it will be a better day. And live in the moment. And that helped me a lot. That is actually excellent advice for life, yeah. but especially for caregivers. Yeah, for caregivers. You will have terrible days. And you, you just think, you know, the whole world is upside down. Yeah. yeah, I feel like our world got twirled around this year, but, you know... We're still here. Everybody's still healthy. Everybody's still doing well. So yeah, you have yeah. sometimes just have to focus on the basics and keep moving forward because you can't go backwards. You cannot go backwards. Exactly. Well, this yeah. has been fantastic and I appreciate this very much. You have one last tip or anything for people. Like I said, they, your book is out today and there's a link in the show notes where they can go get it. Hopefully bookstores are open again and you can go to the bookstore and get it. Yeah, it's the first, I think, going to be on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, oh, just. Uh, the book. Which is really nice. It's a, yeah. it's a picture of her, her face. And I think it's a drawing of flowers in the background. Yes. Yeah, lotus. Lotus flowers. Oh, those are pretty. Yeah. I love those. Yeah. Well, I wish you best of luck with the book. Hopefully all the listeners out there, even if you're an adult child caregiver like I was, it's probably still a useful book to read because every little tidbit of information, every little tool you can get, it's just one more coping technique, one more. I've learned so much towards the end of mom's life and after she passed away that I wish I'd known earlier. So I try to help people learn all this stuff earlier in the game than I got. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jennifer, to give me this opportunity. You're welcome. Yeah. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.